Rivka, hi. What's up? Should we all be muted? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us, which uh, will be a, hopefully a fascinating conversation. My name is Brendan Tui. I'm the co-founder and president of Peace Players. From our organization starts almost 20 years ago, we've prioritized working with and advocating for girls and young women, recognizing the barriers that they face in comparison to their male counterparts. We are really pleased today to have a fantastic group of panelists. Jackie Alemany, a Washington Post journalist, and more importantly, a former college basketball captain, uh, will moderate the conversation. Jackie has spent time with Peace Players. She knows several of the panelists and can also speak to her own uh, personal transformation through playing sports. During the second part of the conversation, we will hear from members of our leadership development team, uh, programs from across the globe, and we'll also invite you to submit your own questions through the chat function. Uh, without further ado, uh, please welcome Jackie. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time, uh, especially on the day after Equal Pay Day and during Women's Month. Um, I hope you're all celebrating it every day, but really uh, every day of the year, not just this month. Um, but I wanted to introduce our standout panelists. Uh, thank you all for taking the time. We have people all across the world right now in all different time zones. We've got Rebecca Ross, the senior program manager and head coach of, in, of Peace Players in Jerusalem. You can say hi, Rebecca. Hey, what's up? Um, we have Chinny uh, in Baltimore. She's a program manager. She started her basketball career at Duval Senior High School in Maryland. Um, Welcome, Chinny. Good morning, yes, thank you. We have Tando, our Peace Player, South Africa Operations Manager um, and Leadership Academy Steering Committee member and longtime Peace Players participant, zooming in from South Africa. Uh, where are you in South Africa right now exactly, Tando? I'm in Durban. Welcome. <laughs> what time is it? Hello, start? everyone. Uh, and we've got Julie Yunez, a former director of measurement and evaluation at Peace Players, who's now at Social Impact um, as a senior technical specialist. Um, welcome, Julie. Hey, everyone. Hi, Jackie. And then lastly, we have Megan Bartlett. Um, she spent most of her career working in designing and advocating for programs that use sports to promote youth development and positively impact communities. Um, welcome so much, Megan. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of you for taking the time out of your day. Glad to be here. Um, and if I, if I can just, before we get into things, um, as you know, when you first speak, if you could just say your full name, just a reminder to everyone. So I feel like some people sometimes on Zoom are, you know, just want to tune into the programming. So they put it on in their car, just say your full name. Um, and uh, let's get right into the conversation. Um, you know, and I, I just want to say Peace Players really is the, the perfect organization to be facilitating this conversation. Um, as you know, most of you know, uh, they use the power of sport to educate and inspire young people around the world, um, especially particularly in communities that experience conflict. Um, and also, you know, as I think a lot of us on this Zoom are a little bit biased towards elevating women. Um, that is a huge goal of Peace Players, encouraging young girls to get involved with sports um, for the first time, so, you know, breaking barriers in a lot of their communities where it's not necessarily uh, the norm for women to be playing sports and getting out there in a leadership position. So I want to start off with everyone just going around and uh, in just a few words telling me what Women's Month means to you. Chenny, why don't we start with you? I'm going to put you on Absolutely. the spot. Absolutely. My name is Chenny Nwangwo, um, and a little bit more about me. I played professionally uh, all over the world for 11 years as a professional basketball player. But what does Women's Month mean to me? It means a lot. It means empowerment. It means phenomenalism. It means perseverance. 
it's a symbolization of hope, right? It's the existence that change is inevitable if women and men around the world continue to fight and advocate for women's rights. That's what Women's Month means for me. So I'll pass it along. I'm Nolatando Mswili from South Africa. I'm the operations manager for PPISA. Um, for me, it means celebrating women, showing off the achievements, showing off the accomplishments, showing off what we, no we normally don't see on a normal basis. So as much as women should be celebrated more, it's great to have a month that really, really showcases the talent and the accomplishment of women, also inspiring other females who are watching and also just instilling knowledge in those who don't know. So that, that's what it means for me. Megan, why don't you go ahead? Sure, yeah. Um, I think for me, uh, both of what Ginny and Tondo said were great, but I think for me, it actually means um, like 11 twelfths worth of work to do. Uh, so, it, you know, one month is great. Um, and I think we have a lot of, uh, we have a far way to go to make sure that we're doing the same kind of celebrating of women that we do in this month, every day of the year. Yeah, I was going to add on to that as well. Um, uh, I think that we still, it, it, it mostly reminds me that we have huge gaps, um, that have to do with, you know, gender inequality, especially in sports, especially out here in the Middle East. Um, it's nice, it's amazing, it's inspiring, and we should celebrate women and girls as much as we can. Um, but it mostly reminds me personally that, you know, we still have a lot, a long way to go. Jules. Yeah, no, I'll just chime in. I think um, a lot of what I was thinking uh, has been said, but just to go on Tondo's note about celebration. So that's the first thing that I think about. I mean, I was first introduced to or really thought about International Women's Day um, about a decade ago. So a, an organization I was working with in Senegal had a really huge celebration for International Women's Day. Festival, parade, band, music. Um, and I had never seen anything like that before. We don't really do that in the US. Um, and it was kind of the first time I thought, wow, like, you know, we're really celebrating women. We're really kind of lifting them up. So I, for me, it really strongly resonates with that, but then also kind of having that moment to have these sorts of conversations where we're thinking about kind of where are we in terms of gender equity and kind of where do we need to go? So it's both that celebration as sort of has been captured by what everyone said. It's sort of that celebration as well as reflection moment. And, you know, that is, it is, does leave me with a good opportunity to thank you all for your efforts. I should note, you know, athletes have long been influential leaders in the fight for social justice and equality from a, a very local level, community, grassroots level to a national level. We saw Megan Rapino visit the White House in Capitol Hill yesterday and call for equal pay, excoriate the NCAA for their inequitable treatment of women. And now we're seeing Congress open up an investigation into uh, the treatment that I'm sure you've all seen that's gone viral on the internet. Um, but for people who aren't necessarily on the US women's national team yet, how do you all recommend that um, you know, they could get involved with tackling issues of gender discrimination on a daily basis? And we're not going to do every question with everyone answering, but I do feel like I this these are questions right now that I really do want to hear from all of you and from all of your unique different purviews. Um, I'll I'll go, um, Jackie um, Nolatando again. For me, I think how you carry yourself and how you stand for yourself in the confidence that you have and what you believe in kind of trickles onto other people. For example, if you're in a space where there's a lot of discrimination and you stand for what you believe in and you fight for what you believe in, somewhere, somehow, it's gonna make a difference to someone. And from there, it's gonna to trickle to another person. So I think we need to be bold and confident in everything that we do. And we need to be confident in what we believe in and what we want to achieve. And we shouldn't be scared or apologetic about it. And I think having that kind of confidence will show to other people, you know, Tondo, well said. This is uh, Shane Longbo. Very well said, and I agree. Um, and I think something that's really tangible is just using your platform, right? Um, for example, when you see these types of articles, you can use your platform to post these types of articles and get this discussion going. Um, I, I remember I posted the NCAA 
uh, a video on my on my network and a guy replied, oh, I feel really sorry for women's sports. I said, you know, don't feel sorry for women's sports. There's nothing to fear. What we need to do is when you're in a room and you hear someone talking bad about women's sports or women in general, advocate for them, right? If you really want to make the change, be the change that you wish to see. Um, and that's from the male's perspective. And just like Tondo said, from a female's perspective, we can walk out in confidence and we can continue to use our platforms in a way that doesn't just uplift us, but it uplifts other women as well. Um, and it goes deeper, right? There's so many other things that we can do. There's so many places that we need to start, but starting with yourself, I think is the most impar most important thing, really. It's really imperative in the movement uh, for women's rights and equality for women. Yeah, um, this is Julian. It's just to kind of build on that. One thing that I, and it's a very small thing, but one thing that I've tried to become more aware of and do in recent years is to actually talk to my female kind of colleagues and peers and males as well about what they make. Um, I think earlier kind of in my career, it was more of a taboo discussion and you didn't really talk about salaries. And I think what ended up happening a lot of times is that, you know, people, certain people were making more. And in, I've been in cases where, you know, males, um, there might've been different kind of pay structures uh, and, but nobody knew because nobody was talking about it. So having more of those conversations, direct conversations, even if it feels awkward, um, I think, you know, obviously people make different things and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I think it's hard to tackle these issues if we don't, if we're not aware and we don't talk about it. So just trying to do that kind of small thing has been a behavior that I'm slowly trying to change. Yeah, I just have to add on to that, Julie. I feel like I had my own experience recently where women bend over backwards to seem amenable or easy to work with. And um, I feel like sometimes you learn the hard way that you just need to explicitly state and stand for what you want and need um, and, and and take no less than that. Yeah. Even if you mean you're standing by yourself. Yeah. And I've also been surprised. I feel like I thought it was going to be awkward. And then the people I ended up asking and talking to about it felt less awkward about it than I did. So <laughs> I ended up being pleasantly surprised that, you know, these are conversations that people want to have um, for the most part. And so it's just a matter of kind of doing it. Especially uh, athletes, you know, female athletes, <laughs> obviously that's like the worst, you know, what we made compared to men, not only in the, you know, NBA, WNBA, even in, you know, our local Israeli league, you know men get paid like at least 20 times more like it's just like not even um so it's you know all over well rebecca is is there how or how do you handle that uh, is that something that you feel like you're arguing with your peers on a daily basis with or i mean late yeah i mean lately just i mean <laughs> thanks to megan rapino i'm uh <laughs> Uh, since they became vocal, I mean, I mean, this past uh, WNBA season, the summer, I mean, they were like, it was like all over the news, like uh, front pages on a daily basis, even here locally, um, in social media, obviously, and um, it made, you know, our uh, local Israeli uh, D1 um, division, um, you know, chairmans kind of to, you know, we, we spoke up. Uh, we call it some meetings and, you know, it's, it's a lot about budgets here and um, it's a government uh, um, issue that, you know, we're fighting. Uh, there's a huge inequality with uh, the, the budget, budget wise. So, um, that's, it, that's a big issue. Um, and it also goes down to like facilities and stuff, you know, we don't get the same hours, obviously. And then, you know, we don't get enough fans, so they don't want to pay us because we're not good enough, but we don't, we can't practice because we don't have the best hours. So, you know, it kind of, it's a cycle. Um, but girls definitely, and especially players became much more vocal, like this past year. And I was like surprised that, you know, active players, uh, you know, weren't afraid to, you know, speak up and, you know, um, go on TV and, you know, social media and talk about, you know, all these issues. So, yeah. And Megan, I think. Did, did yeah, you... I have um, just one thought. I think the way folks are talking about transparency and the way folks are talking about advocacy is so important. And it just makes me think, though, about what Peace Players does so well, which is get female role models into the lives of younger females who need them. Um, and so if the the women who are doing these things, having these conversations, um, advocating from their platforms, doing all the sort of message sharing 
are also spending time with the next generation of young girls, then they're just going to think it's normal to do that um, and not something that you have to sort of go outside yourself or like take on the way Julie's taken on those difficult conversations. All the girls that Julie mentors are going to think that's normal. And I think that's really a beautiful part of what Peace Players is doing in all over the world and what more women can get involved in and be a coach, be out there with girls who need you. And, and Chinny, you had briefly touched on this, um, but I want to get to the topic of men. How important is getting buy-in from the men uh, around us? You know, I interviewed Draymond Green yesterday, who uh, has been a big advocate, um, or I guess a big pro opponent of the NCAA, but a big advocate of female basketball players. Uh, and, and he said that, you know, the NBA was once a money pit and that that same kind of investment is needed in the WNBA in order for women, the, the playing field to be leveled and for women to reach that level of profits and success. How important is male buy-in? And I'm curious if you have any explicit personal examples of, you know, men who have been resistant to your view of the world uh, and haven't been as open um, and progressive and how you've dealt with that. Uh, I, that's a Chinny here. Brilliant question. Uh, loaded, but brilliant. Um, and it's kind of what Megan said, right? Uh, we're talking about representation, right? We, we need the women to be out there to represent so girls can say, oh, this is normal. Um, this is actually something that I can do. And so it's the same thing here, right? It's a two-way street. There needs to be representation from men. Men need to be in position to advocate for those women when they're not in the room. They need to be in position to advocate for women when they see other men who are not talk who are talking poorly about women's sports. And we're talking about sports, but women in general. And so so the push to have men at the forefront of pushing women, women is very, very, very important. Personally, um, there have been many situations that I, as a professional athlete or just an athlete in general or woman, uh, have had to really like stand for it with men who are posed uh, questions like uh, <laughs> being a professional athlete, they'd be like, uh, do you guys even get paid? Like what? You know, those types of questions, like as if the sport is completely different now that women are playing it. And so having to just uh, be that voice uh, to advocate for women has been something that I've done all my life, all my career. Um, and it, but yes, it's very, very important. It's so important for men to be on board because we're talking about power dynamics, right? They have it. They are the ones who are leading in that role. And we're all we're asking is to be treated equally, right? Um, and to be able to share that power dynamic, to be able to uplift women, because, I mean, it's just, it, it's the way it should be. And so without going on a tangent, um, I think that men have to be at the forefront of this, this movement. It's not women against men, it's men and women together, moving women in the direction that we should be moving in in the first place. And maybe even it's beyond advocating, it's really yes. examining your own power and standing exactly. out and getting yourself out of the way. Right? Four women coaches in the WNBA, 12 teams. That To me, that's eight men on notice. So right. um, I think it's, I think it's advocating together and also being willing to say, you know what, I'm in the wrong spot. Yeah. Creating those opportunities for women. Absolutely, Megan. Yeah, this is Julie. Um, so I, I know social media isn't always the best example, but I always tell people, if you ever have questions about, um, you know, where we are in terms of sexism and misogyny, go follow the Bleacher Report, um, which I'm sure many of you all do, and look at the comments whenever they post anything about the WNBA or women's sports in general. Um, it's pretty shocking. And, but I think, again, social media isn't always a good reflection, but I think it does show kind of where we are um, in a lot of ways. And so kind of going back to the, the question of male athletes is, and celebrities who have, you know, rec in recent years kind of been coming to more women's basketball games, been kind of speaking up. Um, I think they have an influence in those kinds of spaces. And so having them speak out is going to make an impact in a way that, you know, a video or a photo of a WNBA, WNBA player isn't right now. So it's, it's important to have that kind of support um, from those players. I think, yeah, I mean, I agree about the male athletes. I think uh, the basketball world lost. I mean, Kobe Bryant was a huge, I mean, ambassador for women's basketball. I was following, you know, uh, Gianna for, you know, she's the exact age of my players and 
it was like a super double tragedy in so many aspects. Um, but I think we lost like a big, you know, potentially, you know, the guy that could have took us to the next level um, because, you know, he's, you know, really, really up there. And he was like all in, you know, on coaching and, you know, he came to college games and he was all over the place um, and he they just started. So I think, you know, people, you know, Steph Curry, he has, you know, two girls or three, two girls. So I think, you know, someone, you know, big like that can definitely make a huge, huge impact. Just to add on to um, what Julie said, I just read an article yesterday um, that highlighted that um, for the NBA, the first all broadcast female was on. And for me, that was shocking because in this era, it should have been done a long time ago. So I think also it involves the big organizations that are run by men. It takes them to take the first stand and to kind of implement these things for the actual players and other people to just also get into that stream. So I think it's important for those big organizations to get into promoting women and equity in gender. So yeah. Nintendo, while I have you, a question for you and Rebecca, um, because I think obviously in the US, you know, there is congressional legislation and local and state changes that are sort of in the works that could potentially provide women with equal pay or more equitable treatment. But I'm wondering in South Africa and Israel, what is that landscape right now? And are, change, are government changes possible? Are they in the works? Could they actually help women? Can you give us an update on what's going on in your countries? Um, I'm gonna speak on South Africa. In South Africa, there are um, different policies, legislations that, that have been rolled out for gender equity but they are just legislations. When you look um, deeply into it, there's no implementation or the rollout of those um, legislations in practice. So it's like it's been done just because it has to be done in this democratic era, um, but there's no actual implementation and there's no measures of what the actual policy does. So in essence, it's null and void, you know? And I think we're also oppressed with cultural barriers that prevent men from looking at things holistically, but they'll focus more on culture rather than progression of South African citizens as a whole. So yeah, that's where we are. Wow, that's like pretty accurate. That's like, like exactly what's going on out here. I mean, the awareness, it's just, it's a cultural barrier. It's not even if we get the money and the budget and like, it's just so hard to bring girls you know, to sports here. It's not like, you know, in the States, even if we had, like I'm saying, uh, something near uh, Title IX, like you have in the States, you know, that passed a long, long time ago that, um, I mean, I, it'll help, but it definitely has to also come like, you know, bottom up, you know, from the schools and from the teachers and from the society and the parents and, and the principals and the community. Um, so it's something more deeper than just, you know, um, the government and, you know, uh, legislation, legislation, so. Um, so yeah, and of course we have, you know, our security issues that, you know, the government sees that as a top priority. So most of the budget goes there and not to sports and not to, you know, education, so. And I'd love to hear a personal experience of discrimination from each of you that I think can also better speak to where you're all coming from. Um, like, for example, I was just thinking, Rebecca, I remember during visit to Israel, it was a real education for me that, you know, part of the, a big part of the battle for you guys was getting buy-in from parents that it was even appropriate for their daughters to be playing basketball. Um, so I'm wondering if you can each give me an example of, um, you know, a difficult and a discriminatory situation that you overcame and, um, and, and how you did that. I see you, Jenny. Um, yeah, there's oh, yeah. You got like many stories. I don't know uh, which one to tackle. Um, so you said the parents, the parents, it's, first of all, nothing changed <laughs> since you were here. Uh, we still deal with the same issues um, um, in terms of, uh, you know, the parents. Uh, it's just like, it's mind, it's just shocking, especially, you know, during COVID, you would think that the parents would want the girls to go out more, be more active, do something. It's like, nothing changed it's like just it's still the same uh, barrier um, exists 
Um, so the, the biggest thing is just to physically bring them to the gym. Once once they come, it's it's much easier uh, because they just make their parents' lives m miserable until they send them back. So that's that's the easy part. Um, but it's hard to convince uh, you know the principals to come into the school, you know, to give girls more opportunities in Jerusalem. You know, Arabs and Jewish, none of them. Um, I mean. Arabs obviously more than Jew than Jewish girls, uh, but none of them have any platform that they can play uh, sports um, um, in school. It's just it's some girls never played basketball until they, they were like 15 or 16. It's like they never even hold. The, it's like it doesn't even exist in most of the schools. Um, they have gym class maybe once or twice a week, and that's it. And you know when you want to come in and you know give them you know more opportunities and another platform, then you have to like fight the principal basically and convince her why the girls deserve an opportunity. And um, so, yeah, so we're still uh, dealing with that um, issue. I think my discrimination uh, is uh, unique in the sense that you, you can't look at genderism without, in my case, looking at racism because they're intertwined, right? Uh, so I'll give you an example. In high school, we were reigning cha uh, national champions, uh, state champions, two years in a row. And the boys who hadn't won at all, they would get all the better gear, right? They had the support. They get the better gear. They had the better time of play. They would play at, uh, at 7 p.m. prime time, and we would play at 9 p.m. And, and, and we'd already established ourselves. So that's one. And then, I, and then one where it's coupled with racism and genderism is uh, having played international, there was a team I played for and uh, racism, it was racially motivated, but also uh, I was discriminated because I was a woman. There was a coach that called me, a, you know, out of my name and spat at me. So th those, those types of things happen. Uh, but what do we do? We persevere. <laughs> we keep going. Um, you, I, you don't let those types of things deter you from your, your purpose and what you can do to advocate. And I keep saying the word advocate because essentially that is what it is. Like you have to get out there and do the work. And like Megan said, you have to make sure that you're surrounded with people who can uh, edify you, right? People who can uh, support you and people who can hold you accountable so that you can continue to do the work. So you don't, when there is trauma and discrimination, fall fall back and, 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 and become small in the presence of it. So there are many, many examples that I can give you, but what do I do or what do I do personally? I keep going and what can I pay it? How, how do I pay it for it? I make sure that I instill that in my programming, my curriculum, in my girls. Anytime I'm somewhere where there is a girl that is looking at me, I am letting her know how phenomenal she is and how that's only going to get better and how she needs to go out and continue to believe in herself, right? We're, we're creating mantras. We're creating a, a, a space where self-talk is extremely positive, right? You don't need people to cheer for you if you're cheering for yourself and moving in that direction. So I'm really passionate about that, but I think trauma for me has pushed me and given me, uh, you know, that sense of empowerment to move forward because someone sees me, they just don't see me in the right way. They're going to see me in the right way at some point, so. And, you know, I do, I want to, I read a statistic yesterday that I thought was worth noting in your comment on, you know, the intersectionality of sexism and racism. Uh, the gender gap is obviously narrowed, um, I think, by about 17% in recent years. Women are still paid 17% less than men, um, but uh, Black women are still paid only 63 cents for every dollar paid to white men, and Latino women are only paid 55 cents for every dollar paid to white men. That's lower than I think the like 82 cents or something white women are, are paid to men. Uh, so it's it's a really good point, Jenny, that I think we all need to remind everyone of all the time. Uh, and along with your point about mentorship, if, you know, in these, in this, in sharing your anecdotes, I'm curious, you know, how essential a mentor or a, a, another woman or someone, a leadership figure was to you to overcome this adversity. Huge, huge, right? Because, um, uh, again, I have a male mentor, <laughs> and he is white. Um, and what happens there is that he, believe it or not, it's going to sound odd, but he creates the opportunities, like he helps me get the opportunities because he includes me in the conversations that I would necessarily not be included in. Um, and so that's what I, it, it's so important. It's so important to uh, on, on, on both scales. So when we have this conversation and we're talking about women's rights, I also have to, you know, take a step back and think about 
what that looks for a black woman, because then there's organizations that say, oh no, we have the representation of women, but then they're all white. Uh, and there's no one that looks like me. There's no representation there. So having a, a mentor is huge. I try to surround myself with at least one or two. And believe it or not, sometimes it's harder for me to get a woman as a mentor uh, than it is for me to get a man as a mentor. And that is just the reality of it. And so that's what I mean. It, it needs to start with us. Uh, we need to, to, to walk out uh, in confidence and understand that we're not just, it, it sucks that we have to represent every woman every single time we step into a room, but that's the position that we're in. Um, and we need to hold on to that and really walk in faith and have power in that, in that position uh, instead of feeling small. So, yeah. Megan, you want to say something? No, I was just thinking of when you were talking about your discrimination, um, the, my, the one that sort of always like comes so clearly into my brain makes me feel like I'm a thousand years old, but, um, it wasn't that long ago, truly. Um, when I studied abroad in college, I studied in Scotland and I got there and I was like, great, their spring season is when they play soccer. Um, I'm a soccer player, sorry, basketball folks. Um, but I, um, you know, I had just had my season and then I show up in Scotland and I get a sort of bonus season and I'm really excited about it. And I get to the first practice and it's being coached by a man on the men's team, not by a coach, by a man on the men's team, right? That sounds like it should have happened in the 1950s. I swear it wasn't the 1950s, but I was like, this is not okay. Right. Like this is just so not what we do. And so what I what we did was I said to the rest of the women, we don't need him. Like if, if they're not going to give us a coach, like we'll coach ourselves, we don't need him. And so we went into the athletic director's office and said, no, thank you. We'll coach ourselves. What do we need to do? Like, what, what is this guy hypothetically responsible for? Cause we'll take that on. And that's what we did. And, you know, I, I don't think that's like, it was so obvious and so um, blatant uh, that, you know, for the rest of my career, there have been so many more insidious examples of things like what Julie's talking about, being underpaid, being told I'm too emotional, being told, you know, I'm all these things that sort of um, are, are not maybe as blatant as being coached by a man on the men's team. <laughs> um, but I think they come in packages big and small. And to Chinny's point, you need a combination of people who are willing to say, we can do it ourselves. We don't need that. And people who are willing to say, um, put their arms out and say, come in here where you wouldn't be invited otherwise. Megan just reminded me of a story of a traumatic story that I experienced. Um, I also played soccer and I was scouted by a team which happened to have a male coach. And at that time I had braids um, on my hair. So the first day of practice, when I, when I came to practice, he told me, oh, you look too glamorous for practice. And mind you, I had no jewelry, no makeup, just braids. The next practice, I, I came with a different hairstyle and I, I was acting very feminine compared to all the other players. And he strictly came up to me and he's like, do not act so clearly. This is a masculine sport. And it's about high time you cut your hair. That was when I was like, no, 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 that's not gonna happen. I expressed myself at that moment. I had that confidence at that age to express to him that no, this is not how you're supposed to be treating someone. You don't base sport off of how someone looks. You nurture the talent and you harness the talent and that's it. And I think at that moment he told me I was very, very emotional. So from there I made a decision to take myself out of that environment because it wasn't conducive for me and it was very toxic and it was gonna have a very negative outcome for me. So I took myself out of that environment, but I, I expressed myself before I took myself out of that environment. And I also, I, I encouraged other girls to have confidence to speak out and express themselves because it was gonna continue on and on and on. And that shouldn't, ha it shouldn't be how things are. So I think, that was a very traumatic experience for me. Well, and I'm wondering, Tano, though, what gave you the confidence to? I was already in Peace Players by then. <laughs> I'd already um, been part of the leadership um, development um, program at Peace Players. And there are a lot of life skill lessons that they taught us 
during that period and also just having a different mindset believing in what you believe in and stand in your ground don't live don't let people deter you from what you believe in just because they don't understand or they are not knowledgeable or they're ignorant about something stand for what you believe in continue advocating for it no matter in which sphere i've been doing it in sports and corporate everywhere i go so i think that's the confidence i i gained from peace players also all right, Jerome, your, your pressure's on you. Yeah, um, well, I actually just want to loop back to, there was a mention about mentors and the importance of mentors, and that kind of made me think, um, you know, I think what's helpful with mentors is that, you know, you don't, sometimes you get stuck in habits and you don't think to, to do things differently or act differently until someone kind of reminds you. So um, the example that I brought that came to mind is, when I was talking earlier about starting to have conversations more about salary, it was actually what spurred that. Um, I think some of you know Amy Selko, so she um, worked for Peace Players as well and was someone that's kind of a mentor to me. And one day casually offhand, she said, oh yeah, I have those conversations with people. And, that, and then I was kind of like, well, why don't I do that? Um, so maybe not meaningful to her, but it, it changed a lot for me. So I think, you know, just having someone that, um, can get you to think differently is really important. Um, and, you know, is a really big role for, for kind of a mentor. Um, so. Guys, we only have a few minutes before we're going to have to get to the Q and A. So, but I do have a lot more questions for you that I do want to try to get through. So if everyone can try to be as succinct as possible, I would appreciate it. Um, but. Uh, Tando, you remind me of, I've got to ask the key question about how is Peace Players contributing to equality as a nonprofit? Um, you know, you state that Peace Players gave you the confidence and uh, the skills to handle a sexist coach. Um, what other ways, in your opinions, have you seen Peace Players contribute to equality, either um, in your own life or the, the lives of all of the people and the young girls that you guys have already touched? Oh, you're on mute. Thank you for that. As you all know, uh, we use the power of sport to unite, um, educate and inspire young people. So through our program and our core values, which is seeing people as people inside our transformation and culture of collaboration, we instill certain knowledge and certain skills in our kids. We use a number of tools to equip them with dealing with life, not only just basketball, but we tackle things holistically. So you get a child that's coming to play basketball, but they have a very, very, very bad background. There's a lot of issues at home and this is where it's a safe space for them to express themselves and speak and do what. And we use that to teach kids a lot of skills and a lot of and instill a lot of knowledge to change the way that they think hence why we deal with a lot of kids from different communities because in South Africa you know of the racial divides and we use our program to bring all those kids together and kind of change the way they think and see each other and kind of just erase the institutionalized um, oppression that's been instilled in us for many many years so as peace players, we tackle those issues by bringing people together. Because you can say you're advocating for equality by not doing anything. But as soon as you bring people together, that's where you're more impactful. And if it, you measure your success by the way that they think at the end of the program, have they influenced other people in their sphere of influence? Have they trickled how they think onto their parents? You know, it's, it's all about that. Although peace players, I love that there's a little bit of a trickle up effect. Yeah, <laughs> it's not me. Um, Jack, you just want to add if I can put on my kind of monitoring evaluation um, yeah. hat for a second. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, this is really uh, so. I think one thing that peace players does really well that, um, especially in comparison to say other programs, is that the staff really thinks intentionally about all the things outside of the actual program activities. And I think Rivka, uh, sorry, Rebecca <laughs> mentioned this earlier um, in terms of kind of the parents, the family, what's going on in the community, 
how are people getting to and from? So I, you know, actually before this um, was just kind of working on, uh, just completed this study for work on youth engagement in programs in Jordan. So across different sectors, civic um, democracy and governance, education, employment. And, you know, one of the big findings was uh, there are really a lot of barriers to women's participation or um, to young women's participation around kind of my family doesn't support me doing this kind of program. Um, you know, certain areas of study are not considered appropriate for women. Uh, we're not safe going to and from the site. And so I think, you know, a lot of programs don't necessarily, they're focused on the activities and what kind of we're doing once we're at the program site. But I think what Peace Players does, um, particularly, you know, um, speaking to my experience working in the Middle East program is really thinking about engaging with families, really thinking about where are activities located? Can girls get to those places? Is, is it safe? What time, you know, are these activities happening? Is that, can people go back and forth, you know, if it's not too late at night, um, things like that. So kind of taking the whole environment of participation into account rather than just participation itself, I think is really key um, to kind of how Peace Players does things. Love to see that study if it's allowed to it's come. coming <laughs> jenny go ahead okay yes um i think they've all said it uh quite well and eloquently um we do the research right we don't just we go we're on the court but it's far beyond the court uh and we we look at the history of uh the the, the cities that we're in and the people that we're dealing with we invest in the people um, and we invest in, in them in a way that it's not just the programming on the court, right? It, 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 it's far deeper than that. And I think Tondo and Julie have both said that um, in a way that I don't want to take away from it, but that's exactly what we do. It's brilliant. It's amazing. I've been, I'm, I'm a newbie, so I'm a, I'm a rookie here. And I was like, you know, I, I'm always blown away when we create these things and I understand what it is because just being a professional basketball player is one thing, right? Using your platform and to see the world in this way, but then being able to step outside it and see uh, sports for social good, for social justice, for social change is huge. And that's what Peace Players does. Um, so I'm, I'm just happy to be on board, <laughs> honestly. I think I'll just add on to that. I think being a professional basketball player is much easier. Um, I also play ball. It's much easier than being at all the other things, things that you just said, because, you know, when you, you know, you get on the court, you play, you're out like you don't you don't even mess with any you know other you know social issue and dealing with all the other things is just so much you know harder and um, challenging um, but also uh, re uh, rewarding so I think it kind of goes uh, both ways. I think I'm here to uh, this is Megan again as a non peace player as uh, being okay. able to see the sport for <laughs> development field from outside. I think I'm here to say that what Peace Players does really well is the women on this panel and all of their colleagues who are out there setting the example. Um, so the coaches they hire, the, the coaches they put in front of young people, the women who are in leadership positions, they're walking the walk uh, as much as they're talking the talk. Yeah, props, props to Brendan for bringing at least me in. Thank you, white man. Um, but I do feel like I've sort of, um, I have uh, not stressed enough or touted enough the accomplishments of the women on this call. Rivka, you reminded me of the, she's a professional basketball player. Everyone should know that. Um, so don't, all of you don't hesitate about bragging on yourself. Um, but really quick in a sentence, I'm wondering how you all stay motivated before we get to our other questions from the LDP uh, and other people on the call. Um, how you all stay motivated when you feel like your efforts and the long, you know, fight towards social justice are plateauing or falling short? Um, I can speak on behalf of myself. Um, so I'm Nigerian American um, and I'm the first generation in America. Um, and as a woman, I just think about, I am, and, and I said this to someone the other day, I may stand here alone, but I am a representation of many. Uh, and so when things are not going right, they're just not going right in the moment. Um, and the fight is an upward hill ba battle, right? And, and you cannot allow, you know, small things to deter you um, from the path. And so I'm very highly motivated. <laughs> I'm passionate about the work I do and I make sure that I put myself in position uh, to be passionate and have energy. And despite the outcome, 
continue to praise the effort and the process um, because eventually great things come if you just stay steadfast in your belief. And that's what I try to instill in myself and all the young girls that I work with. And I'm so happy to be surrounded with women who kind of have that same uh, mentality. So that's what I have. And I need like a voice memo from you every day. I will send it to you. Yes, no, absolutely. Yes. I'll just um, add on to that. I mean, I don't think any of us are in this, um, you know, to win any, you know, surprise or reward. We're just in this because, you know, we truly believe in what we do. And that's why, you know, every little barrier or any big, you know, issue that comes up, um, you know, we just know how to deal with it because, you know, we're in this um, because we believe in change and um, not, you know, because uh, we're, you know, making the most money or because it's uh, sexy or whatever. Um, but it's, you know, something uh, uh, deeper that we feel, you know, within, you know. Um, so, yeah. But we definitely yeah. don't want to. <laughs> And we want more money. <laughs> uh, I, I think for me, there's a Zulu proverb that I always um, go back to. It says, no mungawa, So it just means even if you fall down, no matter how many times you fall down, you get up and you get up and be even greater. So in whatever you do, you're going to fail. You're going, you're going to make mistakes, but learn from those mistakes. Learn the lessons that you're required to learn and then get back up even bigger and greater. So yeah, I, I would love Tanjo if you could share that in the Zoom chat right after the panel. If you could write that out to everyone, it would be awesome. And teach me how to say it too. That was beautiful. <laughs> okay, start there. Okay. <laughs> I think for me, what keeps me going is the other badass women in my life. Yeah, this is Julie. I think um, just kind of round this off. For me, I'm lucky enough in my kind of life and, and work as well um, to be regularly coming into contact with, you know, the kids from the Peace Players Middle East program or, you know, people that have taken part in education or kind of other programs um, that I've worked with. And that is motivating for me, you know, seeing a kid. I have lots of stories, particularly when I was a fellow um, at Peace Players Middle East of you know, girls that I worked with that were in the locker room crying the first the first activity because they were so scared and then by the end they're you know really excited to play basketball to be kind of on a team with girls from a different group um, than they are so those kinds of like have coming into contact with people and kind of seeing those changes is, is motivating. Awesome and I and not to be totally cliche or corny but it is really interactions, discussions, conversations like this that I feel like keep me going are a breath of fresh air, provide perspective uh, and inspiration. And just hearing you guys like, it's like getting me pumped up. Um, so thank you for all of your thoughtful insights. Okay, we're gonna get to some questions from our LDP participants. Um, first, we're gonna go to uh, Yale and you have asked, as women who play sports competitively, how are we influencing the fight for gender equality in that regard? Who wants to take that? Oh, hey, how are you? Good, thank you. you do you want to go ahead and ask yourself? Uh, what? I didn't. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you talked about it a little bit, but I wanted to ask, what do you think, as women who play sports competitively, is our influence for the fight for gender equality. Who wants to take that? I feel like we got to go to Rebecca as the, the pro here. I heard you, 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 you were the captain. <laughs> right now. Um, so as a, Professional athlete, first of all, in Israel, it's not very, um, unfortunately, it's not that common to be, you know, a professional athlete. I still get, you know, people ask me what I do. I say, you know, I play professionally and they're like, what? Like, they didn't, they, they're not even, even aware of the league that it even is, exists. It's like, you know, um, but I think um, as a professional athlete, we see, especially, you know, these past couple of years um, that we have a platform, especially social media. Um, um, we could use, you know, our voices 
um, because most professional athletes have a lot of, you know, followers and fans. Um, so I think our platform, if it's social media, TV, even, you know, the WNBA, they were like wearing all, all these, uh, you know, gear, uh, uh, say her name, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think uh, we could, you know, um, the awareness of, you know, um, social ish justice and any kind of, you know, gender inequality, um, we have the right platform, um, you know, men and women, by the way. So, um, so yeah. Only lately I discovered that I, I actually have a voice that pe people listen to as when I was like in my prime time, I was afraid to talk. I did not talk to no one about anything. I was afraid that no one would take me. Um, I wasn't a talker. I was just like, you know, I, I was signing on the contracts, whoever offered the most money and that's it. I was afraid to talk and no matter how badly I was treated, I was just, thank you, appreciate it. Let me play ball and I was out. So today I understand that it's not, that's not the way. And, you know, I'm not here just to say thank you and appreciate, you know, any little, um, you know, thing they throw towards our way. Um, and that's, um, that's what I'm trying to teach, you know, the younger generation as well to use their voices um, at a, for, from a very young age and not wait till you're 29. Um, and so, yeah. we have a question from Serene. Are you on the call? Well, uh, she had asked the great question. I don't, I don't know if um, she's on, but she had asked the great question on how is women being exposed to competitive sports at a young age impactful for their, the trajectory of their lives? I see you nodding, Julie. Well, I was actually thinking about Megan <laughs> with this question um, because so what, I, what immediately came to mind is just how kind of the high dropout rates of women and I feel like Megan has more to say about this um but just, yeah just the high dropout rates and that if we're kind of getting girls start uh, exposed to sports and active at a young age and then kind of putting the supports around them um so that you know when they hit those dropout points at middle school that they're kind of you know protected um from the things that that normally cause them to drop out that we're you know building all the things that we know are is good about sports um but yeah I don't, Megan do you I actually was nodding more thinking about you and some of your work around this uh no I think you nailed it Julie I think the idea of you know why is it beneficial for girls at younger ages to be in sport um is that hopefully the earlier they start the longer they'll stay um, which we know to be true. And if they stay, then they have the opportunity to be exposed to these incredible role models. They have the opportunity to get all the benefits of positive relationships with adults, with peers, uh, the opportunity to have all the benefits of physical, uh, from physical activity for sort of their physical health, their mental health, their resiliency, um, and all the other sort of social and emotional outcomes that we know young people can learn through sport when sport's done right. So it's so beneficial for girls to be part of the sport experience for all of those things. And with the major caveat that we have to do exactly what Julie said, support them and make sure they stay and make sure it's an environment that's for them um, and not just relying on the sort of norms around what sport has always been because sport was created by men for men. And we need to think about how, uh, we need to listen to girls and and create environments that they want um, to be in, that they want their sport to look like. And actually, I, I have to follow up with a question of my own because I was um, reading an interview with a, an old colleague of mine yesterday who said that uh, Gail King once sent her an email and she didn't uh, encouraging her and uh, just complimenting her on her work. And Gail King probably didn't realize it, but it had an, a huge impact on her career and her confidence. And she made the point that a lot of the times women don't even realize that they're being mentors, but there are so many little ways that they can. I'm wondering if you guys have little ways that you want to share with everyone on, um, you know, how you keep encouraging people. And maybe that might not even be intuitive to, to us, as, especially as you noted, Chinny, you know, maybe sometimes female mentors might be hard to come by. What are ways that we can all better uh, that, that skill? 
I think at the, the most rudimentary level is a mom who supports her daughter uh, in sports. <laughs> um, I think at the most rudimentary level, it's uh, encouraging uh, a, a young woman when you have the opportunity to encourage that young woman. Um, I think what Megan said was amazing and brilliant. And statistically, we know that if girls who develop these core characteristics and develop these, this confidence um, take these uh, uh, these elements with them and they're as they age, they're going to be very successful women. Most women who are in CEO positions, presidents, those women have had exposure to sports. Um, and so I think it's just uh, something as significant as uh, encouraging another woman, uh, encouraging a young girl. And those are small, tangible things. Those are small things that we can do every single day that helps uh, young girls build their confidence, moving them from competent to competence. And confidence, I think, is at the core of everything in terms of developing women in sports, developing young girls in sports, and having them stay with the sport uh, as, they, as they move along. So I would say that. I think what we know about girls is that they're socialized to, um, uh, to, do thing, to focus on being perfect. Um, they're socialized to not do things unless they know they'll be successful at them. And sport is this incredible opportunity to overcome that, to get used to trying new things, to get the opportunity to fall down and get back up. And so building on what Chinny's saying about confidence, for me, it's about courage, right? It's about being brave and not perfect. And how do we as coaches or parents or uh, mentors in every part of our lives encourage women to be brave and not perfect? Megan, I'm, I'm sorry, it's so per it's amazing that you said that. And I'm thinking of effort praise, right? Boys get a lot of effort praise. And so boys get this thing where they they, they, they get their, their power from the process and girls get a lot of outcome praise. Oh, you're so pretty. Oh, you're so beautiful. Oh, you, you, got, you got A's. And if we can shift the narrative to effort praise for girls and we're praising the process. So when things don't go the, the way they'd like to, when they are trying these new sports, they can understand that the process, if they keep with the process, things get better. If they keep with the process, they'll be able to define who they are. If they keep with the process, you know, this will become enjoyable. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. What about you, Julie? Yeah, I think one thing I've I started to realize recently um, is that I'm no longer kind of in my early 20s starting off my career. <laughs> I guess I knew that, but um, what I mean by that is that I, I think I have a little bit more power than I used to um, in terms of opportunities that I can provide for other people. Um, and so one thing I'm trying to become more conscious of is, you know, I lead a lot of evaluations or studies. And so I can, if I have people who are kind of younger entry-level women who might not get certain opportunities to do things, I have the ability to kind of give them work on my studies that I'm leading, give them, you know, certain parts of, of things that they might not be assigned to by the company, um, but that I have the ability, and it's a very small thing, but just kind of that I have the ability to, um, yeah, to provide opportunities to people and trying to use that more then uh, to use that more and more. Tando, anything that you do that you feel like is a small but helpful I thing? Think the biggest thing that I learned as a mentor is to always create a safe space um, for kids um, in terms of them speaking and expressing to you or just having that, that safe space to confide in you to speak about their mental state, the emotional state, because as much as we can look at the sport aspect of everything, being a mentor is holistic. So you need to be able to tackle everything holistically, not only looking at the opportunities you can focus on, um, but also how to change someone's mindset, how to counsel someone at certain times, how to assist them in whatever they're going through. I think it's, it's just a holistic thing that we need to keep in mind, you know? Uh, and someone on Facebook asked this, and it was a question I have, and I think it's really important, um, but the idea of dismantling these rigid concepts of masculinity, you know, how, how do we do that through the way that we coach our boys, um, right? Because it's not just the women here, um, but, you know, someone on Facebook had also asked what I find shocking 
is the misogynistic behaviors instilled in young women's minds. Uh, I feel mm -hmm. like things are all sort of interconnected. Uh, how, how do we fix that? How are you guys coaching your boys? Yeah, Jackie, um, I just, just really quickly, because I was thinking about that as Tondo was yeah. talking. Um, so I had a really interesting ex experience a few years ago. A friend of mine uh, and I coached a middle school boys team in DC um, for a few years. And it was my, actually my first time coaching boys. I had only really worked with girls teams before that. And it was really interesting. And I think I took two things from it. One is that for most of those boys, I was the first time they had seen a female who could play basketball. <laughs> And that in itself was, it was funny to see the reaction to that. Um, and, you know, it's, I'm sure they were exposed to kind of other females and female athletes, but just seeing someone who, a female that was actually teaching them skills was a change for a lot of them. Um, and then another thing that we emphasized a lot uh, in our coaching was, um, you know, thinking about kind of how we treat each other and our emotions and teamwork and, you know, things that aren't always emphasized with boys. So, you know, for example, one thing that we used to do that it was so funny to see the evolution of this throughout the season. So at the end of every practice, we had the boys come together in a circle and they had to give two claps. So they had to kind of call out a teammate who they saw hustle for a rebound or, you know, do a great job making layups, you know, and improving that skill from last week. And then everyone kind of give that person two claps. So kind of going around calling out effort um, from teammates. And so in the beginning, it was like, oh, this is so corny. I can't believe it. You know, we don't want to do this. It's And then by the end of the season, they were like running to the kind of mid court to start that at the end of practice. And it was everyone's kind of favorite thing to do. Um, so just, I think boys want that kind of, um, those kinds of activities, but they're just not given them a lot, I think. Um, so the more that we can do that uh, and bring that into sports and, and other aspects um, of life, I think is helpful. Your future wives will thank you for teaching them how to communicate. <laughs> Megan, I think um, you have a real, oh, go ahead, Tanda. Oh, no, I just wanted to say also for life skills is very important. I think in my experience, I've had a number of discussions that have evoked certain emotions or certain thoughts and it, it it gave us an opportunity to see how kids really really thought and what they perceived what they believed in and I think those discussions having those discussions where it's either you speaking of gender equity um, gender equality um, sexuality or whatever we want to see how kids really think so we know how to tackle changing their mindsets you know I think also it's important with boys to have those discussions so you know where their mind is and how you can tackle change, you know, in them. So, yeah. I don't know exactly what the sport equivalent of this is, but I think it's an important thing for us all to be thinking about is that the most effective gender violence programs don't target women to try to not get raped right? They target men to not be rapers, uh, rapists. So I think there's something in this about how do we make sure that men see this as, as their problem um, and not just a problem that a bunch of women talk about on a panel, um, that this is something that they are actively engaged in looking for solutions to. Um, we often ask girls to solve this problem um, and that's, you know, we want to hear their voices. We want to hear what they want. We want to elevate their leadership, but we also need to be posing the same questions to boys. Uh, I also think that, um, I think that was great. I also think it's moving away from the fact uh, that we are terming masculinity and femininity. They don't, they don't have genders. There are no genders for masculinity and femininity. And we're always talking about, well, girls shouldn't do, but there's no gender with those. Uh, there's no genders applied with those. And if we can continue to see masculinity and femininity independent of gender, I think that that helps with the lens that we, we approach and, and, and coach our boys with. We always talk about having programs at the very rudimentary level for, for girls, but we need to have programs uh, with the lens uh, for boys to see girls as their equals. Um, and so I, I think that is at the, at the root of a, a lot of the change and how we have to begin to approach um, the whole talk when we talk about masculinity and femininity. I, and I, it's, you know, it's a, another conversation for another day, but I, I always go back and forth with this one. I'm just, well, where's the gender implied? You know, I, I, I've always felt that I have, uh, I 
firm in my masculinity and my femininity. There's no, uh, you know, I didn't know that it, it applied to me just because, I mean, I just don't think that uh, it should be linked to gender um, at all. So there's that. Before I go to our last LVP question, Rebecca, I want you to close this question out because I've seen you interact with the boys. You are magnetic. They so respect you. I'm wondering if you can share your wisdom and how you do it. Yeah, Julie was talking about uh, <laughs> um, Julie Cabal, by the way. She's uh, <laughs> in the post. Um, Fun fact, we used to play together over a decade ago. <laughs> Rebecca and I. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, being a role model, a female professional basketball player in Jerusalem um, back, you know, 15 years ago, I mean, it's just so hard to explain to the girls how life-changing, like what they're doing right now will stick with them for life. But it's just so hard. Like you come, you coach, you go home. You don't, you don't really deal with, you know, all these, you know, gender issues and social they come, they want to play basketball and they go home. They don't really, you know, overthink, you know, only when we get older, our, our minds kind of, you know, <laughs> but playing, like, I think I changed so many perceptions by just playing with boys when I was like, you know, in my, when I was like 13, 14, 15, whatever, 16 in Jerusalem, I played with like thousands of boys. Like I was there every day during the summer uh, for like 10 years, like straight with me and another friend. And until this day, I walked the streets in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, I could be up north, I could be in Elat, anywhere I go, people, these guys come up to me, hey, Rivka, Rivka, ah, like they always, like, and I, I can't recognize not any of them, but they, they remember me because I was the only, you know, girl that, um, so they, even just that, you know, example, role model, you know, just being there with them, you know, in, in the, you know, I'm sure, you know, that changed something in, in you know, in their, um, I mean, I'm assuming. Um, so I think, you know, I think Megan uh, touched that as well. Being a role model is key. I, I didn't have a role model growing up. I only had men uh, coaches. And I think it's key because um, they, you know, they, they, they're very hungry to, you know, just look up to someone and, um, especially, you know, the young boys and girls, you know, second, third grade. Um, so I think uh, being in, you know, physically being there is key for those young ages. And I think that's, that's um, what Peace Stars is very good at, as Megan said. Can I talk about Rebecca's coaching for a second? Because <laughs> yeah, so, um, I, I have thoughts having seen her coach a lot um, about why she's so magnetic. Like one thing I think I would, I would say that people would describe her coaching as you know, exacting, maybe a little tough. <laughs> um, but one thing I think that's imp that I've seen watching her coach practices is that she is tough on both the boys and the girls in the same way. And a lot of the girls, she, she kind of demands a lot from them. And I've seen them really, you know, respond to that and kind of feel, it's almost like the a transfer of toughness when you watch her, when you watch her girls, because, you know, they'll miss the shots and no, I know you can make that shot. Like, do it again, you can do it. And then it's like, they do it again and they make it and you see that confidence. And then, and then you see them go play with the boys and want to beat them. So I think um, the way she kind of transfers her confidence that maybe comes from playing with boys to her girls and her boys and her boys see that too, right? Um, they're kind of in the same practice environment. So I think that, and maybe going back to the kind of conversation about mentors, I think that's, that's probably where that comes, comes in. I think you touched on a very important point, Julie. I think the power of the coach or the mentor is very, very important since they play a central role also in that person's life. I think the mistake that we make as coaches, I, I've, I've witnessed this, is that we coach girls and boys differently. Uh, when you come to um, a practice, exactly. you say boys, 20 suicides, girl, girls, 10 suicides. It should be the same. And that decreases the competitiveness in, in girls. And there was a point where I, I watched a team where the girls were practicing softer than the boys. And when they got to another school, they were trashed because the girls were as competitive and as strong as the boys because they coached in the same way. And I think that's really, really important. And don't differentiate based off of gender, you know? I think that's the mistake that most coaches make. I'm gonna 
go to our last question from AJ McKin McMinn in Northern Ireland. AJ, do you want to hop on real quick? Hello. <laughs> um, so my question is, I'm a, a woman in sport. Um, I study sport in university. That's my degree. Uh, I have grew up in sport. And you guys have talked a lot about like kind of your motivation, but what is like one thing you'll say to a young girl that's struggling through adversity in sport, whether it's comments from males, self-doubt, like what is one thing you'd wish you could say to a female, like a young girl coming up through sport? Trini, let's start with you. Words of wisdom. You're on mute. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, that is a, a very good question. I am, I mean, as you can see, I'm about the energy and all that uh, good stuff in between, but I would say, believe in yourself. I know that's very cliche, but it is the exact thing that I would say. It's the exact thing that I say to myself on a daily basis, believe in yourself, believe in yourself. You have all the tools uh, inside you to be phenomenal. You have all the tools inside you that make you capable. You have all the tools inside you uh, that should move you into a room and into a space with confidence, believe in yourself. I know that's short and sweet, but that's exactly what I would say. And I would continue to say that over and over and over again, so much so that it became her mantra and what she, and she, uh, uh, that's so she believed in herself, sorry, excuse me. Um, because someone said that to me, someone lit that fire in me and it's never been uh, turned off. So that's what I would say. Um, Chinny, I think you took one of mine. Um, I also think that that's important to believe in yourself and also be confident in yourself and what you believe in and put in the hard work and fill those spaces, those spaces that you think you can't fill, fill those spaces and be bold and strong in what you do. You know, I'd, 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 I'd say that. Meg, go ahead. So I already said mine. Uh, for me, it, it come, all comes down to be brave. Don't be perfect. I'm going to put it in mine too, because I don't want to close this out. I want someone more inspirational to speak, but I feel like my, when I'm, my biggest issue is sometimes I feel like I'm hustling, I'm hustling, I'm hustling, and I'm not really seeing the result I want to be seeing. So I just always am reminding myself to keep at it. It will in some way pay off, whether it's you know, a visible or tangible thing, or maybe it's, it's more, it's a little more subtle and helping the people around me just keep at it. I guess my, my thought um, is just about kind of surrounding yourself with the right people. And if you're hearing sort of negative feedback, or criticism of, of what you're doing, then you're probably not around the right people um, and maybe don't have the right, or need to seek out different support structures. Um, Cause when I think about what's been helpful for me at different steps, it's, it's been the support structures and the environment, the sport and non-sport environments that I've been in. So seeking the, trying to seek those out. Um, All right, Rebecca, the pressure's on. I'm gonna go with uh, Megan here. She says, um, uh, being brave. Uh, uh, I think, I don't know, like two weeks ago, I was asked if, you, you know, you could teach someone to be brave or is it something you're, you're, you know, born with? Um, and I definitely think it's something, you know, you could teach, especially young girls from a very young age and boys. Um, and, um, you know, if you, like, as you said, you know, if you stick to, you know, what you believe in, you know, that you're hustling and hustling and hustling and you want to see the result, you know, sometimes you, you won't even benefit from your hard work. It'll be, it could be, 20 years later, it could be two years and it could be after your lifetime. It could be your kids, it could be your, your community. Um, um, but I definitely think uh, being brave is, is, uh, is, is something that A, you can teach and, and B, it's, it's crucial to succeed. And um, how is that? <laughs> well, guys, we have run over our time. I just really couldn't stop the conversation because uh, it, was, it was so thoughtful and insightful. Um, you know, I encourage all of you to reach out to us. If you ever need a mentor or having a bad day, need some advice, we're all on social media um, and never hesitate to reach out. Thank you all, our, my brilliant panelists, for your time and insights and your preparation and for all of the work that you do to make 
um, women's lives and boys' lives, men's lives better uh, around the world. Um, thank you so much for joining us all today, everyone. And thank you to Peace Players. You guys just do uh, the, the best work. It's an honor to be associated with you all. Thank, thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you. Jackie, you're the bomb. Thank you. <laughs>